Actually, let's get started, man. It's, it's first. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have you. This is. Uh, I gotta admit, I'm a little starstruck. I did have you on my fantasy team back in the day, so it's. Um, <laughs> so, so it's. Uh, it's um it's exciting to have did you ever have people come up to you at that time be like man what what happened this week like you're on my fantasy team do oh, people man. actually do that all the time all the time really yeah yeah whether it's in person or online like oh, man what's going on i see you sitting out of practice are you gonna be ready to go for sunday uh yeah you get a lot of it that's amazing i love that that's so funny um Man, we, we're excited to have you. I mean, I, I think I, I, everybody knows your name. Everybody knows, you know, they know the Pro Bowl career and they know what you've done. But I'm, I, you know, as I've dug into your story, your upbringing, man, it's such a good story. And, you know, you, a lot of, you know, themes of adversity and perseverance and all that stuff. I, I'm curious when you go all the way back. So it's how did you, you know, you're in the midst of financial hardship. Most people don't see a way out of there. Like, how, how did you even, why do you think there even was a spark to believe that you that you could make, that it could look different. Most people, you, the world around you is the world around you. What yeah. do you remember? Was there even looking back? What was it that sparked the fact that like, Oh, I, this, this can look different. Where'd mm -hmm. that belief come from? I think the mindset for me was always, it had to be different. It had to be more. Um, and if you ask me, um, you know, what was a uh, deciding factor for you make for you making it out. And it was kind of, uh, a two-headed thing. Um, one, I was chasing a dream, but also running from a nightmare um, in a lot of sense. So uh, just knowing that I knew that God had more for me, I knew that life had more for me than just that. Um, and I was going to do whatever possible to make sure that that was a reality for myself and for my family. And uh, so, because you can see it, you can see it in other places, you can see it yeah. in TV, uh, I would read books uh, about um, Jim Abbott, uh, who yeah. was a one-armed uh, sure. pitcher. Uh, for the Angels, right? Played for the Angels, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, I believe yeah. so. I, I believe remember so. Jim Abbott, yeah. And uh, then also there was uh, Wilma Rudolph, um, who was a track athlete that had to overcome some insurmountable odds uh, in order to have success being an Olympian. Um, but I would see like these other athletes again, like Barry Sanders, like, well, they're just like me. They come from different neighborhoods. They come from different communities. But I believe that I had the same ability or at least the opportunity to to change my future as they did. So I just walked in faith. It's interesting. Have you have you considered I'm sure you have at some point, have you considered for a moment the fact that that you look back on Wilma Rudolph and Jim Abbott and people like that who inspired you to made you believe that something was possible? And again, Jim Abbott, you're right. Who would possibly think that that a man with one arm, I mean, he had half of the other arm, yeah. would be able to pitch in the major leagues at the highest level. So he inspired you. Have you considered the fact that you are that to others now? Like when other people you think about maybe, a, you know, the younger kids, the kids who are young in financial hardship, they see you 5'8", not necessarily physically built for the NFL from a, from a stature perspective, but you made yeah. it. Have you, have you thought about that, that you are that, you are that to others? Yeah, man, it, it's, it's, you know, when I think about, all the things that I'm so grateful for throughout the course of my life. Um, that is one of the things that like, you know, the platform that I believe that God has given me, um, uh, being a professional athlete, uh, not being an entrepreneur. It's just like, man, you know, I hope to inspire and encourage that next Justin for set, you know, somewhere. Yeah. And that's pretty cool to think about that. I could be that spark like, you know, Jim or Wilma or Barry was for me. Um, you know, I was able to pick up a a book in Scholastic Book Clubs, right, sure. uh, back in the day and pick up and read about Wilma Rudolph and read about Jim Abbott. Um, but now, you know, people can go to my, go to a YouTube, watch my videos, watch yeah. my story um, and, and dive into like how I was able to accomplish the success I was able to accomplish. And to know that that could be a spark for someone, uh, that's pretty cool. What were your, what was your parents' perspective there? They knew they were your, your dad. I think he, like you said, he was a preacher, truck driver, mm -hmm. owned a barbecue mm -hmm. restaurant. I mean, he was, yeah. he did a bunch and he was an entrepreneur himself. Um, yeah. How did they encourage you along the way there? You had these dreams and aspirations and I'm, and I'm sure as a parent, it has to be hard to, on one hand, you want to encourage, but then you also don't want to put in a false sense of hope necessarily how did your parents handle that when they saw you with your dreams and aspirations from that young age 
Oh, they were very supportive. Um, in their minds, there was nothing that me or my brothers couldn't accomplish, uh, right, if we put our minds to it. So there was no negative uh, pushback or there was no doubt. Um, it was all like, man, yeah, you can do it. Um, and yeah. they reinforced that. So the support system was there. The encouragement was there. The belief was there from um, from the family and the inner circle. Um, I just had to own it for myself, and I ended up doing yeah. that. Were there any teachers coming up here when you were when you were down in Mulberry? Were there any teachers that you had that really kind of saw that young genius in you or spark athletically? Whether it's a teacher or a coach, what who who were some people that inspired that and maybe helped foster that to where you could grow that belief? Because it has to be hard. It has to be hard to hear again and again. You're not strong enough. You're not fast enough. You're not tall, tall enough. That has that has to be discouraging mm -hmm. at some point. At some point, somebody starts believing all of that stuff. So who mm -hmm. who counteracted that negative feedback you heard from others? Well, I had um, uh, a young coach uh, when I was growing up. My first years playing football, first couple of years playing football, that believed in me, uh, Coach Frank. That uh, just uh, you know, my size didn't matter. Just gave me the opportunity. I had high school coaches that believed in me every step away, college coaches, pro coaches, uh, you know, when there was a lot of doubt, it was, it was always someone there um, to kind of just reinforce that, man, you, you belong. Um, and I had what it took. Um, but it was always, I, I could think back, especially early on as my grandmother, uh, who I spent a lot of time with because my dad, you know, having all these roles and jobs, my mom uh, uh, busy as well, that uh, she was there. Um, to take me to practices, to uh, take me to the recitals. Um, spent a lot of time at her house, uh, you know, weekend, uh, on the, during the weekday, and I got out of school, and I'm in, you know, waiting for a football practice or basketball practice, and she's in there watching Days of Our Lives or <laughs> Guiding Light, and, uh, and her just pouring into me, you know, when I had problems or when I was a little, had some uh, fear or doubt uh, about, competition or opposition that I was facing. She would always just feed into me scriptures and pouring into me faith and love and just, just reinforcing that, you know, I had what it took no matter what I was up against. So um, I had that, I had uncles that all just like, they were really strong um, when it yeah. came to the support. Did your grandmother, was she, was, was she able to see you play in the NFL? Did, did she, I she may still be with us, but did, did yeah. she, was she able to see you play in the league? She did. She did. She was able to see me play uh, in the NFL. Uh, uh, she passed away um, uh, my seventh year, I want to say, in the NFL. Um, but yeah, uh, she would show up even when I was in college. She lived in Florida, going out to Cal, uh, going out, out to Berkeley, California to watch and see me. And uh, I remember she was just always get upset when the, when my office line wasn't blocking. She was always <laughs> on, she was always on the, my office line. I always had to hold my grandma off of my office line because they weren't taking care of her grandbaby. But uh, but yeah, she was she was strong and very impactful in my life. It's amazing. I love that. You've alluded to it. And, and obviously your, your story can't be told without your faith story. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to hear I would love to hear your faith story not only from a young age, how that was, how your parents instilled that in you, but then how it became kind of your own, how it, even in high school, you talk about you were 18 years old, having received some of those brutal feedback you get, which, hey, your scholarship got pulled, sure. but you have the maturity, even at 18, to lean into God, to pray, to to seek him and all of that. And then even as you've grown up um, into it and has become more and more your own, I'd just love to hear, take a few minutes, I'd love to hear your faith story. Yeah, for sure. Um you know, there's this notion that when kids go to college, they lose their faith. And I like to say that when kids go to college, they don't lose their faith. They lose their parents' faith. So they never had a relationship uh, with God for themselves. So it's really, the, it's easy to lose that um, when you're not, somebody's not forcing you to go to the building of the church uh, on a weekly basis. Hmm. But at an early age, I was a preacher's kid. Like I said, I would, you know, uh, I would hear about this this man, Jesus, uh, the God that wanted to save me and had a plan and purpose for my life. And I just know someone that as a middle child and dealing with the middle child syndrome, never, never feeling like I fit in anywhere. I just felt like, man, if I wanted to accomplish anything, if I wanted to do anything great, that I was going to have to lean into 
this guy that I kept hearing about. At least I was going to give him a try. And uh, I just remember early committing my life um, to God as a, you know, a 12 year old, uh, 12 year old kid and being in middle school and just like, God, I'm just, I'm going to lean and trust in you that um, you do have a plan and purpose for me and that, the, and you will bless me with the desires of my heart. And, uh, and, you know, I will have impact for you. So that, that was the, that was the initial uh, connection, right. And that first step of my journey, but just as I've grown and uh, experienced so many different things in life, he's just constantly revealed uh, to me that there is levels uh, within the faith, right? And uh, and as I constantly faced rejection or opposition, he just kind of showed up in new and real, authentic ways. Like even when I got rejected to run Notre Dame, when I was in that basement and I was crying my eyes out, and I remember because at that time, I, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a believer and I'm I'm the kid that's in church all the time, um, playing the drums in church, I'm going to Bible study, I'm praying every night, I'm reading my Bible and things like that. And uh, so I'm mad at God and I'm saying, God, like, why is, why is, uh, why does it seem like all of my friends and other people are getting the blessings that I been praying i've been praying for um almost as if the uh the uh the older son in the prodigal son story uh right it's just like why is everyone else getting the blessings like i'm i'm here i'm i'm the one that's praying to you having a relationship with you and i remember when i was on my knees and i was praying to god like you got to show me something you got to give me you got to you got to give me something to go off of of here like i can't keep doing this um and not seeing any return or anything, God, you got to open up some doors for me. And uh, at that moment, I did the only thing I knew how to do. I opened my Bible and I just literally, I just said, God, you just got to show me something and just flip through the Bible up in the air. It, it landed on the floor and opened and it landed on Proverbs three. So as I begin to read Proverbs three and it gets to five and six and it's just like, yeah. you know, trust in the Lord God with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll direct your path. And in that moment, and I was a believer for you know, at least over five years at that point in that time, and I felt something I never felt before. It felt as if God was, I felt this warming sensation over my body. It felt as if God was wrapping his arms around me and letting me know that I, I got you. Like there's this, like this peace that I had internally. Nothing on the external and circumstance has changed, but something on the inside of me was just like, ah, something's going to break. Like I feel it in my bones. Uh that that God had a plan for me. So I dusted myself off and, you know, just like, God, I'm going to just trust you. I'm going to excel at what I can't control. But uh, a few months later, that door opened and, you know, I ended up going to Cal. I ended up, you know, playing right away. Ended up going to be a starter. Met my wife there. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing. That, um, that whole thought of... First, I mean, you know, as a dad, and you got to think, not that we can, con you know, comprehend the mind of God, but you think, mm -hmm. you know, there are moments with you kids, you're, with your kids, and you have five kids, mm -hmm. where there's something they're going through, and you do, you just give them a hug, and you be like, I got you, it's okay. And it, and it's almost like they can't understand what you're talking about, but you know, like, I got something for you. It's almost like God's in the background, like, listen, I got, I'm working on something in Berkeley right now. I can't tell you about it, but like, something's coming for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so, that whole idea and what's cool about that story what i love about that is it's only i mean here we are talking you're talking how many years later and that is that disappointment is such a big part of your story mm. it's like we have to go through the fire like it wouldn't we have to go through the fire and that's when god's proved, proven faithful it's not like you know but but you know being a person of faith you don't avoid anything like that but you have god yeah. with you through it and so it's just amazing that all the stuff that we believe that is terrible and and brutal and difficult well that's the stuff that's going to lead to our greatest story right man it is so true um and it's easy to uh run from that or uh resist that because it's not comfortable right it is not something when you're going through it you're just like god i i want more of this pain i want more of this frustration <laughs> like, nah that is not the the feeling that we have when we're going through adversity or trial 
but with the right mindset and you know thinking about romans 8 20 8 28 and saying all things work together for the good of those that love the lord and are called according to his purpose like knowing that even this bad this frustration this disappointment can be used for my good right he's shaping me and molding me into the man i need to become in order to have the success that i want to have so um yeah with just that mindset um at least that's how i face disappointment that's how frustration now is an entrepreneur and it gets difficult it gets tough um it gets painful um but knowing that there is a benefit uh for it all and that this even on the entrepreneur side is like this is a sanctification vehicle in which i'm being uh stretched in places i've never been stretched i'm being pulled in places i've never been pulled because a familiarity will breed complacency and I can become familiar with God, right? Uh, you can become familiar with Him, and just like oh, I'm go to pray, go to church, go to Bible study. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a check. You know, you checking off the boxes, but God is like, I, I want deeper relationship than that. I, I, I want more of you. I want to let you know that there's levels. There's, there's more peace for you. There's more joy for you. There's more love for you. Um, but in order to get there, uh, I gotta stretch you a little bit, and uh, you know that can be hard to to swallow at times, but it's for our benefit. I remember my kids, when my kids were young, I remember my, my uh, daughter, she was having some really severe leg pain and, and doctor said, Hey, these are growing pains that she's feeling. And so you have that term, Oh, growing pains. But I remember saying to her, I remember saying, Hey, it hurts because like your, the, your body in its current state can't handle the growth that's happening inside of you. And mm. so it's the same exact thing. We're going through these things and it hurts and it hurts, but that the end result of that is growth. The end result of that is bigger. And we want that. We want those growing, we want the growth, but those pains are real, those pains physically. And I think it's like a metaphor that God has for us as mm. this medical for of the, of the physical pain in our bodies in order to have physical growth. That's the exact same thing spiritually is it's got to hurt a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. and that doesn't make it fun, but it does make it more gratifying. And it is a absolute necessary part of the process. Yeah. No, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, speaking of painful things, what was it like rooming with Marshawn? <laughs> it wasn't painful. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure it was, that guy's hilarious. Yeah, he was, uh, it was, it was great, man. Um, I'm coming from, uh, the kid from the South and meeting a kid from Oakland, California. And, um, you know, just two different, uh, areas in the country, two different cultures, but, um, just a lot of the same, uh, values, um, in life when you talk about family um authenticity um and love like you know loving humor laughing laughing and having a good time like we just we shared a lot of that together so uh he's a brother to my man talk to him today i'm mean, almost every other day we're, we're talking Do you really? yeah 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 he's a wow he's a he's a brother to me did he did he eat a lot of Skittles in college too? I know I know his his career thing. He that guy eats a lot of Skittles. Is that is that a real thing or is that just a persona? No no no. He ate a lot of candy. Period. Uh, <laughs> Skittles was one of them. Gummy bears was another. Um, you know he could eat like trash and still go out there and perform. Other you know, other of us you know couldn't. So he was just I mean just like his nickname. He's beast mode man. That guy yeah. that guy is incredible. So what, what was that like? So you're in the league, you played for, um, you drafted in the seventh round, um, mm -hmm. you made the Pro Bowl your seventh year. What was that like for thinking back on the kid who said, I have to, I love what you said. I was, I was chasing a dream, but I was running from a nightmare. You said it had to be different. What was that like the first time for that experience with your parents where you could give back to them a little bit financially, where you said, hey, listen, we, I want to I want to take care of you. What, what was that whole, I, I'm, I think people love watching videos of that, people giving their parents cars or whatever it was, but what, what was the that overall feeling like and being able to kind of give back to them what they've given to you over the years? Man, it was, it was awesome um, to have that. I remember uh, being able to send them uh, a couple of the checks that I was got early on from doing signing deals, whether it's uh, a tops uh, football card uh, deal, and it was just really gratifying uh, to to be in a position in which I could actually help and do the things that I always wanted to do. Yeah. And you know, when you come up from humble beginnings, and you come up uh, the way I came up, and from my culture you just got you're pushed to think more mature at an early age 
right? Um, yeah. You're just forced to think about, you know, you know, I don't know how, how to put it, but you're just forced to think about real life stuff before most people. Sure. And I just, even growing up, remember looking at those McDonald's Monopoly uh, stickers and just like, mom, I'm going to get you that Jeep Cherokee. Or, you know, once I get this boardwalk, you know, we're going to get up out of this situation. Yeah. And and to finally be in a position where I can say, hey, I can bless my family in this manner. I was, uh, it was really gratifying and I, I thank God for it. That's amazing. What, what a, what a feeling, what a neat thing. And for, and for them just to think, my goodness, he was, we thought he was talking crazy all these years and he really <laughs> didn't do it. He did everything he said he would. Right. All right. So you, so you could have rested on your laurels. You could be playing golf every day. Instead, you, you decided to, to literally get in the hustle after you, after you retired, you and Wendell and whale founded hustle clean, uh -huh. um, which you guys are, are doing really amazing stuff. Um, we're, we're going to plug that and make sure everybody goes to the website. Everybody checks out, everybody go, goes and buys it cause it's for sale everywhere. You got partnerships with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. How did hustle clean come along? Tell us about the story, the Genesis of that, how you and Wendell and whale, how you, uh, how the three, you got, uh, got after it and got that going. Yeah, it, it started just, um, one off season. We were both, we we're all college teammates at UC Berkeley. And went off season, just uh, coming up with this concept of this disposable washcloth, this antibacterial toilet that removes sweat, dirt, body odor for the athlete, and um, just figuring out ways in which we could execute and bring it to life. Uh, because we had this pain point as athletes, and we had this pain points as we had graduated from college, and uh, just wanted a solution that really resonated with this community. And uh, that was the genesis. We put the product on Amazon for several different iterations that came about and uh, constantly grew it uh, off that platform. We had some iterations uh, from the product. We, even when it was on the Amazon platform, we was trying to make it better, make it right uh, as a side hustle because I was in NFL at the time with a, uh, a full-time job and my partners was an EMT and a firefighter. At the time, full time, so pretty pretty time intensive job, but it was a side hustle that we believed that was going to be able to create opportunity for us to to put the side hustle down and transition into this full time. And uh, my ninth year in the NFL, I retired uh, 2017 and fully immersed myself in the business as I can CEO and co-founder of the brand. And uh, we got on Shark Tank, uh, we got on Good Morning America, we got on The View, then we got into Target. And that was just like really a, a, a validating point for us as, okay, you know, we got a big retailer behind us and we got some exposure and uh, it was an opportunity for us to expand our brand. At the time it was called Shower Pill and it was going to transition it to Hustle Clean, which is a full assortment of care, not just that that one product that we had, the wipe that we had and uh, for this customer. And uh, yeah, start taking off and going into other retailers such as, you know, now REI, Kohl's, um, Macy's been a number of fleet feet shops and roadrunner sports throughout the country, orange theory fitness now. And, uh, yeah, it's been really cool to see the growth, uh, within the brand, but it had not come without any, you know, a lack of hardship or, uh, difficulty or challenge, uh, throughout the process. I'd, I'd love to hear some of this. So we're, you know, we're, we're a startup ourselves. Give us some, give, I would love to hear some of the pitfalls along the way. What are some of the things you've learned, the real pivotal things that you've learned that maybe can help some others, other entrepreneurs as well, who are going through the same thing? Man, first thing, uh, I got a lot of things that I could share here. Um, <laughs> but I'll start with, uh, just because you're busy doesn't mean you're productive. Um, a lot of times an entrepreneur, you believe that just because you're doing a lot of stuff, and you're working a lot of hours that you're being productive, uh, but you got to be, uh, you know, it's being it's, it's about being more than busy. It's about being efficient with your time and making sure that you're doing things that are moving, actually moving the needle. Uh, so I, I would say that I would say uh, uh, which we didn't <laughs> we didn't we had a lot of business going on. I should say that <laughs> that's the reason why I'm, I'm sharing this advice. Everything I'm sharing is because this is what I've learned. Sure. Uh, then. I would say uh, lack of focus. So being extremely focused on your core customer and your consumer uh, is essential. 
um, a lot of times we start businesses, we th- we start them off with things that we believe that will be great ideas instead of things that uh, we can validate that the consumer believes will be a great idea uh, and it'd be a useful value add uh, for their lives. And so um, being focused on that, not necessarily, yes, you can be able, you can create something that you believe the customer uh, will eventually need, but you want to make sure that that is validated by uh, a need within the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, so and being focused on it because sometimes your customers change. When I started, I thought our customers were going to be, you know, predominantly men, um, high performing athletes. Sixty five percent of our customers are women uh, to this day. Wow. Um, so being able to know, like, OK, I got to focus on this customer. I got to know where they're at, what they're reading, where they're watching, who are their influencers um, and meet them where they're at. Uh, so being focused on that is uh, and obsessed with that is is core. But what else can I share? By the way, I like the word you just used was obsessed. Obsessed. I do uh, like yeah. that word. It's not. It's not just folks. It is. It's. It's an obsession, right? It has yeah. to be. And it's harder when you when you find out that a lot of your you know it's someone who's who's different from you. So it's female. Same with us. It's we thought this was all dads, and then it's 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 a bunch of moms that are buying it. And so then you you have to become obsessive about okay, what's important to them. I love. Mm-hmm. I do love that piece of advice a lot. And, um, and it makes sense that, you know, men are disgusting. Women like to be clean. So of course, <laughs> want to be clean. So it right. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It, it, it worked out for us and, uh, we love our customer now. Um, and just kind of, you know, trying to find ways in which we can understand them better, better each and every day. But th- th- those two are essential. Um, uh, one thing I would say is, like, as an entrepreneur, um, you have to know the ins and outs to every aspect of your business. Um, so, even if you're transitioning from one space to the other, so like, I could, you know, I'm, I consider myself an expert at, at being a running back, right? I can right. teach you a lot of things about the skill set of being a running back, uh, but a lot of skills that would take me to be successful as an entrepreneur is different. Uh, within my sp- particular space and in my specific space, yes, it still takes work ethic, discipline, commitment, uh, resilience, relentlessness. Uh, it takes all of those things, but you know, there's other things like you know, I had to learn like how to operate uh, EDI and being able to c- transmit data from one location to the other, so my retailer can get the signal that they need to ship our product out. Uh, I had to understand finance and understand why why is it important for margins within our business. Um, I had to understand our P&L and balance sheets, uh, cap tables, things like that, that I would have to learn in NFL. So you got to become an expert uh, within your space and every aspect of it all, because at the end of the day, even if you hire someone to do a job in the finances, um, you want to make sure that you have a good handle of information because people, I mean, we're human. Anybody that you hire, they're human. They're going to make mistakes uh, unless you, you know, you, you know, you're working with AI and chat, uh, GPT <laughs> and <laughs> they don't make mistakes, but, uh, but yeah, you, you got to count, you got to consider that. And, uh, and you may, a mistake may happen and it may not be your fault, but you're responsible. So knowing that you just want to be as educated and equipped yeah. as possible, uh, in every way. I got to think is you and I may I may be presuming too much and I'm curious if you if you agree with this but you had you had the odds stacked against you from from getting the league like you said earlier you mm-hmm. know not not big enough not strong enough not fast enough and so I'm guessing that at some point you learned how to thrive and you actually wanted that because that was fuel to you in doing this startup do you are you the type of person that almost creates adversity in your mind because you know how much it can fuel you is that I mean is it do you, do you ever create that? It's almost like people talk about how, how Tom Brady would do that. He would say like, nobody yeah. believes in us. And you're like, everybody believes in you. How are you <laughs> yeah. talking about? Like, you know, cause you are, you're in a great position. You have a great platform. You played in the league forever. You have expertise in this area. And so you do have some things going in your favor to some degree, but is there, mm-hmm. do you, do you like taking the adversity, whether real or, or, you know, some, an obstacle you create in your mind to help you overcome it? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll answer it this way. I will never run from adversity, um, but I'm not. I'm not looking to create it because I have enough of it on its own. I think being an <laughs> entrepreneur, 
Uh, you're just going to have it. It is yeah. uh, something that's, you know, going to happen. Um, you're going to, you know, I joke with my partner who was a firefighter. I was like, you're, you're still a firefighter because we still put out fires almost on a, on a <laughs> weekly right, basis. Exactly. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to seek it or happen to, you know, conjure it up in my mind like Michael Jordan or Tom Brady. Um, I just say if it's, you know, if you're at, it's, it's like you're at the uh, DMV, you know, whatever trouble is going to be, I'm going to grab a number. You tell that to trouble, grab a number, take a seat. I'm going to get to you when I can. And uh, I handle it that way. But, uh, but yeah, I don't have to conjure it up. Yeah, exactly. It's already, it's already there. Yeah. I mean, so, so tell, so the people who are listening, these are a bunch of families listen uh, to the RO podcast. I, I would love for you to tell, you know, who this is for. I mean, this is for, you know, like my wife, she does bar class. I, I could mm-hmm. absolutely see her using these, keeping her, keeping these in her purse. So, who is this for? Tell me the the usefulness of your suite of products in people's lives. For sure. So Hustle Clean is a mission-driven self-care brand for the active lifestyle. So we create hygiene, wellness, and recovery products for the everyday athlete and fitness enthusiast and even adventurer. Uh, we start with our hero product, which is a disposable washcloth that removes sweat, dirt, body odor. So in those moments when a shower is optimal but not possible, uh, it allows you to wipe down or freshen up and allow you to extend your day uh, without compromising your health. Uh, we have recovery soaks, uh, Epsom salt recovery soaks that will help you if you're feeling aches and you're on an adventure or you're finishing a workout and you want to recover well, uh, you've been using better for you solutions and ingredients. Um, we have hand sanitizer. Uh, we have face wipes, dual sided face wipes that are really popular. Um, and we're, we're diving more into the more traditional personal care space, but just hygiene, wellness and recovery for that. That fitness enthusiast and athlete. I just realized how just hearing that that poetry you just you just spoke it really made me realize how bad my elevator pitch is. I mean, you, you <laughs> have, man, you have that thing down. That was <laughs> that was so good. And again, I like I like it came from this like from your you said fitness enthusiast. So that this mm-hmm. is everybody. This is a lot. Most people who are very intentional are out there. They are enthousi- you know, enthusiastic about fitness. That's part of their everyday life. So this is for sure. everybody for you know for the competitive athlete for the professional athlete and then for everybody mm-hmm. so i want everybody to is it hustleclean.com is that correct yep hustleclean.com everybody needs to go to hustleclean.com I, I can't talk about talk about you without talking about you being a dad you being a husband we tell us that in in being an entrepreneur and being a former professional athlete what is that like you know you carving out i say carving out time you being fully immersed with your kids you talk about being focused on the important things i know your kids are, are part of that as well so uh-huh. maybe two questions we talk about that balance of being in fully immersed with your family while you're building up something on the entrepreneurial side and then we, we talk about how you're raising your kids athletically um and knowing your success and experience how are you encouraging them in athletics so two questions one is a dad is as, as an entrepreneur and then two is how you're raising your kids athletically. Yeah. Um, as an entrepreneur, um, and been a former athlete, I don't believe in balance. Uh, I don't think <laughs> it's possible, uh, to give equal amount of time, uh, to every aspect and every title that you carry. Uh, but I do think you can be, you can use that same amount of energy, that same amount of vigor, uh, uh, into all your your roles because I, I don't believe that greatness can be compartmentalized and if you want to be great uh, then that should flow through every aspect of your life so if you want to be a great entrepreneur it's not okay for you to be a crappy husband father spouse parent like if you're chasing greatness then the excellency should follow through the standard is the standard so so I try to make sure that maybe you know I realize that there's got to be a level of almost, you know, a healthy obsession, of course, to whatever you're pursuing in order to be great at anything. But also, uh, you got to prioritize and make sure that you're intentional about uh, investing in the most important things, which is yeah. your wife and your kids, you know, your spouse or your kids. Um, so I try to make sure that, you know, when I'm here, I'm present uh, with my kids I'm in showing up in different ways, whether it's, you know, with my wife, with when our life group that we lead uh, with our church, uh, when I'm with my kids, I'm coaching them um, and I'm taking them to practice. Uh, I spend the time with the quality time. We're doing date night with the kids or I'm doing date night with my wife. Like I'm making sure that they're getting quite quality time uh, with me, even though I can't spend maybe, you know, uh, all of the day with them. Uh, so that's what that looks like. 
And then uh, the second question, remind me, what was... Uh, it was how you're raising your kids as, okay. as athletes and athletically oh. and pushing them and dry, when to push and when to dial back and, and how do you handle all of that? You know oh, what's possible, yeah. but, but how difficult that road can be. It's difficult because for me and my kids, they grow, they're growing up differently than what I did, right? They have more and have access to more than what I had uh, growing up. They don't, they don't have the nightmare to run away from, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. You know, they're living a really good life. They, they, they've, right. they've traveled, you know, to, you know, more countries than I've ever traveled to, <laughs> um, uh, before the age of 10. Um, you know, so it's a different lifestyle for them. So the way I look at it is like, I try to make sure even in sports and I try to put them in positions where I can't, they'll never, they'll, you know, Lord willing, they'll never have one of these motel or hotel moments, right. Where, uh, you know, they're battling and water, electricity and things like that. They'll have all those things. But when there's a moment of opposition, when those moments of adversity, we lean into it. And I make sure I can use it as an opportunity for them to develop that toughness and that resiliency that I was able to receive in another way. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, whether it's my kid, I, there was a scenario in which uh, in the basketball season, uh, there was a 20 seconds left to go on the clock. Uh, he could have won the game for his team, but he missed the two free throws uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the game. So we went outside in the backyard and uh, I told him, we're going to shoot. Uh, we're going to get this right free throws until you make three in a row. And uh, we were out there for over an hour and he was crying. He's frustrated. He's disappointed, um, angry at me. And I was, I just want to go in. I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, no, we got to stick with it because I want you to, I want you to put in the deposits now. So when you get that moment again, you'll have something to pull from. Um, yep. And we have to embrace this, this moment of adversity. We got to learn from it. Uh, so we did that. And then uh, the next week, 20 seconds left to go on the clock, 15 seconds left to go on the clock. Uh, in order to tie the game, he gets fouled again at the free throw line. He sinks the two. They go into overtime. Oh. He hits the point to win the game. No. Um, but uh, we lean into those moments. Uh, and use sports as an opportunity for for development. It's amazing that that and that couldn't have played out any better for you as a dad for him to be mad yeah. at you. And then the next, and then the next yeah. game, it it pops up like that. That's so perfect. Yeah, yeah, it was a God thing. Um, how old is your oldest? Ten. Ten. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I mean that is that's the you know it's got to be a balance of figuring out how hard to push, right? I mean, is it yeah. is it um in your kids? Do you think do you anticipate you like? really grinded them or how did the um or like you know at what point do they do you does it become their own that has to become their dream like it was your dream from young yeah age? uh for me as far as pushing and how far to push like if we're saying if we're going to do something we're going to be all out and doing it so i will push you yep. to make sure that you're giving effort you know giving the right attitude and you're preparing the best that you can uh, as far as the results you know they are what they are um yep. Um, and if you don't want to do something and want to, want to want to participate in the sport, then we don't we don't do it. Um, so you got to want to. But, uh, you know, I'm also uh, I'm also there for them outside of the game. I'm also there for them, teaching them, um, whether it's, you know, right before bedtime, I'm telling them stories. I'm giving them life lessons uh, with them on the car ride, using that as an opportunity to to pour into them and invest in them. Um, so I think it's 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 important uh, that if we're going to push hard on one side, that we're loving hard on the other side as well. Man, that's so good. That's what we I'm try to do. That one down. the The last question we ask everybody: You're clearly you're clearly highly intentional in your life. Like you said, you don't <laughs> you don't believe in balance, um, which I love that. <laughs> but um, the intentionality is a word that comes up. That's our theme. Is you know the RO podcast is conversations with people who strive to live intentionally. What does that word and term intentionality mean to you? Um, uh, intentionality is just for me, I think about extreme focus, um, uh, extreme focus on, uh, on the priorities in life. And I try to, again, because life is crazy with five kids and a business <laughs> and wife and leading life group and coaching and all those things that I'm doing, that it's important that I'm intentional extremely focused on prioritizing uh, my time and whether that's with my wife, whether that's with my kids, whether that's 
uh, with parents or what have you, that I'm just having that focused time um, um, with uh, the people that I love uh, because this time is fleeting. Um, as our parents, our parents are getting older, um, as now as I'm getting older, I'm starting to lose uh, friends, teammates, and uh, and just like if you think about the perspective of life and what's important, um, if we want to have impact, we got to have intentionality about where we spend our time because it's, it's things that it's the thing one thing we can't get back. And it's one thing that everyone is willing to waste. Man, we've we've been talking about that so much. It's like we don't, as, as, as a society, understand how little time we have, not just on this earth, but with the people that are most important to us. We, we have to. We have to make the most of it. We have to take in all those moments. Even if it's just little bits at a time, we have to, we have to prioritize those. And to your point, you got to know how to prioritize. You have to know what's important to you first and, and, then, mm-hmm. and then go after it. So I love that. Um, you have speaking of using your time you've been very generous with your time joining us and and here's what here's what i would ask of everybody listening is and i'm going to do this right after we right after we get off the call i'm going to go to hustleclean.com i'm going to get some hustle clean products and just as a thank you i mean it and i want everybody to do it i'm I'm serious i want everybody to do it just as a thank you to you for carving out your time to uh, to spend some time with us and part wisdom on us um i encourage everybody to listen to this have your kids listen to it with you as well justin um, we're, I'm grateful for you, man. Thank you for inspiring me, inspiring us for doing what you're doing, hustle clean, for raising good kids, for, for being a motivation for others who have some adversity stacked against them and knowing they can get through it. And they, they just listen to you. Right. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Uh, extremely blessed, um, and honored that you would, uh, you would do that for, for our brand and, uh, yeah, the, the love is reciprocated. I appreciate it. Hustleclean.com. Also, Justin, you do speak corporate events. You speak at a bunch of events. Mm-hmm. You're very, you know, very motivational speaker. So you do that as well, right? Where would that be? Justinforset.com? Just, uh, Um, Yeah, I travel all over the, the country uh, trying to pour into entrepreneurs and business leaders. Uh, so, yeah, you can find me there. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much. Appreciate you joining the R Podcast, man. Uh, no problem. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm.